Oh, well, hi. Hi, Jill. <laughs> uh, I am I am the actual Jill who uh, uh, inspired Larissa to use my name because it was a nice short one uh, to announce um, to to announce this uh, another reading here at Jill. Uh, my name is Suzanne Jill Levine, and I think most of you know me. And uh, and I'm Jessica Powell, <laughs> and I'm really happy to be here to um, read a little bit from um, the collaboration that Jill and I did together a few years ago of Silvino Campos' book, The Promise. Right. And this, pro and this book was, uh, is actually uh, was the posthumous work that was published uh, after her death. Um, and um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very meaningful for many reasons. First, it's, it's one of the few long narratives she wrote, and really the one novel she wrote, um, uh, number one. Uh, and uh, Although it's, the structure is definitely a very loose uh, structure and um, it, it's about a woman's life flashing before her eyes uh, when she falls into the ocean she falls into the ocean uh, she's just traveling on one of those many um, you know ships that she and her husband used to travel on to go uh, to, to from Argentina to Europe mm -hmm. and uh, basically she falls into the ocean uh, and as she floats all these memories of her whole life come to her and um, and uh, and basically, what what's very fascinating about this book is that when she was writing this book in the 1980s, she was completing it. She was grappling with uh, Alzheimer's, and obviously, one can see how this is um, this is a presence in the novel. Okay, um, um, i.e., and I'll quote uh, a review. The book can be read as a treatise on the dissolution of selfhood in the face of the disease. However, its tactile insistence on the recurrence of memory, its strangeness, and its febrile or, you know, reality are themes that mark the entirety of her work and articulate something more enduring than death. Okay. Yeah, and just so structurally, the book is, is, is put together as a series of linked stories. And it takes its form as a dictionary of memories that the nameless narrator recounts as she's dying, as she's floating in the sea, um, drifting in the ocean after falling off the ship. And the persons she knew throughout her life parade erratically through the theater of her memory. And many of them receive these very brief biological sketches. And they're just like little vignettes, little snapshots of people and events throughout her life. Right. And so what Jill and I will be doing is um, just reading a few, alternating, reading a few of these, um, just to give you a sense of the flavor of the book. So right. Jill will begin, right. she can read the first vignette in Spanish and then in English, and then we'll take it from there. Absolutely. Right. Thank you, Jessica. Okay. We've, we've, been, we've been, by the way, loyal uh, collaborators on, on, on several projects. Mm -hmm. um, uh, our first project, mm -hmm. actually, together longer work was uh was uh, uh the the novel the only novel that Bjoy Casares and Silvina wrote together called Those Who Love Hate Too and it was uh, it's called um, Los Que Aman Odian in see, Spanish and yeah. we translated it as Where the, There's Love There's Hate. Oh that's right there yeah. Where There's Love There's Hate yeah. yeah. So and that was our first collaboration. That was our first that collaboration. Was fun. <laughs> and so we have because these writers are so incredibly witty we've had obviously a very good time but uh, their brilliance is just such a pleasure to work with. Okay, so oh, and, and just a little bit about the way we actually did the collaboration right. is you know essentially what we did is we divided the book in half and Jill did one half, I did the other half, and then we swapped and gave each other feedback right. and, and really had a lot of fun. We would get together and totally. say, well, you know, what do we do about this part? And we would just, <laughs> totally. you know, yeah. Yeah. And it was a lot of, there's a lot of, a lot of fun. A lot of punning yeah. back and forth. Yeah. And I think, you know, ultimately we ended up with a pretty seamless uh, yes. book where, you know, you can't tell, right. you know. Who did Who what? Did what? You know, which, which, is, what is, which is what it's supposed to be. And that's how yeah. Borges and Bjoy yeah. and Silvina mm -hmm. would work together when they yeah. did Project. And I, yeah. I wanted to also add that that one thing that was said about her a lot mm -hmm. is that she's the best, that was once called the best kept secret of Argentine letters because yes. she really was a major figure 
of Argentine modernism. Mm -hmm. And this, and now that she's finally getting published mm -hmm. more and more in English, uh, you know, ours is one of other projects mm -hmm. that have been going on. It's it's really uh, I think audiences have finally been discovering this this marvelous and very unique writer. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so um, I think that what I'm going to do here is uh, uh, you'll, you'll read the Spanish. I'm going to read the Spanish of the, you know, as as we said, we're going to read um, basically a, a couple of these um, the vignettes, vignettes mm -hmm. or, or or little prose poems and mm -hmm. mini biographies of these uh, uh, in her hallucinate, uh, sorry, yeah. uh, both hallucinatory and very lucid mm -hmm. uh, uh, way of speaking and writing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, I'll read in Spanish this first one. Alina Serunda. Alina Serunda era bonita a pesar de sus 70 años. Quien diga que no lo era, miente. Sin embargo, <coughs> los viejos parecen siempre disfrazados, disfrazados y esto los arruina. Yo sé de buena fuente que nunca se bañaba. Impecablemente peinada, con el pelo batido hasta cuando dormía, parecía limpia. He visto a Lina Serunda en la cama, como un cuadro, rodeada de ovillitos de lana de varios colores, como dentro de un nido antihigiénico, tejía primorosas batitas para recién nacidos o escarpines con pompones para viejos o enfermos. Muchas veces, como un ángel que vela sobre la vida alimenticia de los hombres, la vi hacer yema quemada o budines del cielo, vainillas, alfajores. Delgadita, alta, con el pelo blanco y azul, como un vistoso adorno de postre, la considero como una de las mujeres más hermosas. A veces la vista cansada enroje los pár párpados. En ella el cansancio es una pintura que le agranda los ojos. Si fuera mi mamá, le haría hacer un retrato por un buen pintor y lo colgaría en el lugar más conspicuo de la casa. ¡Qué recuerdo de familia! Sus ojos verdes hacían juego con el color del collar, que era verde también. Pero, ¿por qué recuerdo tantas cosas que no me sirven para nada? ¿Qué tedio era estar con Alina Serunda? Y ahora, ¿por qué pienso en ella? ¿Será de mal agüero? <laughs> ok. Ok, here we go. And I need a little sip of water here. Sorry about that. <laughs> Alina Serunda was pretty despite her 70 years. Anyone who says she wasn't is a liar. However, old people always look like they're in disguise, and that ruins everything. I have it on good authority that she never bathed, but she looked clean, with, with impeccably coiffed hair, styled in a poof even when she slept. I've seen Alina Serunda in bed like a painting, surrounded by small balls of yarn of various colors, as if in an unsavory nest. She knitted darling little dress, dressing gowns for newborns, or booties with pom-poms for the ill or the elderly. Often I would watch her, a veritable guardian angel of nutrition, <laughs> as she made creme brulee and flan, lady fingers and alfajores. <laughs> Tall and thin, with white and blue hair like birthday cake trimmings, <laughs> I consider her among the most beautiful of women. Sometimes her eyelids can become red with fatigue. On her, weariness is a pigment that makes her eyes larger. If she were my mother, I'd have her portrait done by a skilled painter and hang it in the most conspicuous place in the house. What a family keepsake. Her green eyes match the color of her co uh, collar, which was also green. But why do I remember so many things that do me no good? How tedious it was to be with Alina Serunda. And why am I thinking about her now? Could it be a bad omen? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Um, so I'll read a short vignette called Aldo Fabrici. Fabrici stooped over with his arms akimbo on each side of his body as if he were carrying watering cans, pails, or garden tools was a very old gardener. I was very fond of him because when I was a child, he gave me fruit, nuts, lettuce for my dogs. His big eyes always looked surprised, and when words failed him, he managed to express himself with his long hands that were like tentacles, enormous sweet potatoes, or monstrous roots. Clean, orderly, devout, he'd place flowers in a glass in front of a print of the Virgin in the tool shed. 
Why are people named after flowers and not fruits? There's nobody named strawberry or raspberry or apricot, which are lovelier than lily. What is falling in love anyway? Letting go of disgust, of fear, letting go of everything. Flying fish remind me of butterflies in flight. What is magical about the sea is that living deep inside it, no one can speak. <laughs> That's really beautiful. Yeah. The next one <clears throat> is Lily and Lillian. Lillian. Lily and Lillian were always together. Everyone thought they were sisters because they wore the same color. Lily was blonde and Lillian dark-haired. But sometimes Lillian dyed her hair blonde and looked even more like Lily. People who love each other end up seeming identical, saying the, sa saying the same words, moving their hands with the same gestures, and biting their lips in the same way. At the age of 20, they fell in love, or believed they fell in love, with the same man. One would see the boy in the morning and the other in the afternoon. He thought he was deceiving them both, but he wasn't deceiving anyone. The two of them were deceiving him because instead of kissing him, they were kissing each other. Instead of adoring him, they adored one another. How green the sea was, how green and how blue. <laughs> I, I would like to swim for hours and hours, but aren't I in the sea now? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> And so the last bit we'll read is from the final pages. And you'll see from this section how the tone can, can shift from you know, sort of funny and uh, anecdotal. You know, anecdotal to then much more contemplative. And so in these final pages, she's nearing death. And, you know, as Jill mentioned in the beginning, she was really writing this book as she was declining from Alzheimer's, and so there's some, a real poignancy to, to these final Absolutely. pages. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. These long days remind me of the city. Could the water, or coexistence with the water, be so similar to the rest of life? Today I walked to this garden that they called a zoological garden. The first thing I saw was a gazelle outside its cage. I approached it. I took it in my arms, caressed it. No person is as lovely as an animal. I have always thought this since the day I was born, and I think it today more than any other day because I feel lonely, and loneliness makes me feel tender. I hugged the gazelle and kissed her lovingly. But why did she allow me to hug her now when she fled from me before? I raised my eyes and saw that she was looking at me and that we were surrounded by a world of animals. Every animal in creation surrounded us in a circle. Tigers, lions, horses, tortoises, elephants, snakes, spiders, cats, dogs. They spoke to one another. They complained, yawned, slept, ran around. Why was there not a single man, a single child, a single woman, either ugly or beautiful? I walked, dragged myself off in search of another world, far from the animals. I did not find it. The monkeys looked at me in surprise. They were so awful that I looked away, but they kept coming back with their dark colors and their hairy pelts. I tried to talk to them. They did not understand me. I tried to play with them. They understood. I laughed. I think I laughed. Mm. They tried to imitate me, and they tried to speak. I did not understand what they were saying, but something in our eyes united us, and I tried to reveal the secret of my life to them. The water was cruel to me that day. I felt the cold again when I went under. One day, will I be able to live in the water? <laughs> no. Well, as you can see, it's a very uh, intriguing, haunting text in a way. And, um, and uh, uh, I mean, her, her humor mm -hmm. is, is really in contrast with the devastating um, aspect of getting older and, and dying and um, I think it's a very I think it's a very important book in how it deals with that mm -hmm. yeah yeah so I think did we mention that it was that City Lights yes it was published, published? by the wonderful City yeah. Lights uh, mm -hmm. which also mm -hmm. published another volume of her work uh, which was at this as this was the last of her mm -hmm. works uh, City Lights published her very first book which is a book of short stories mm -hmm. called The Forgotten Journey mm -hmm. 
And uh, by the way, the forgotten journey that she's speaking of is birth. So it's very interesting how these books round out yeah, her life. Full circle. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Celine Ocampo, if you haven't discovered her, now's the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>